So this is Left Coast Game Man, Season 3, Episode 3, Part 2. An appendix, if you will. And rather than continuing down this rabbit hole, which I feel ultimately has no end, and speaking of rabbits, I heard an interesting joke one time. It goes something like, two people are out on a golf course and it's hot outside and it's damp with moist, sweaty air. And you're on the turn, and usually this is the time where if you're by yourself, you always go home because 18 holes of golf is a miserable waste of time for somebody that um, shoots five over every hole on a good day. Excepting the one time I did hit a hole in one But you're at the turn and you haven't had a glass of water in over three holes and already your lips are chapped and cotton mouthed and you just want to get this hole over so you can grab a little bit of air conditioner and an extra large glass of iced tea with a couple lemon wedges. And then you get there. And they say, I'm sorry, so we're closed. But there's one last glass with condensation dripping on the outside of it. Of iced tea with a couple lemon wedges. But not dark iced tea. Iced tea that's filled up like Rombo Sun Tea style. A large mug packed to the top with little chunks of ice. And so by the time you pour in your homebrewed tea, it's like three quarters water. And you say to your friend, well, In this new era of COVID, it wouldn't be apropos for us to share, now would it? So I'll make you a bet. I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna ask myself a question. And if I answer it correctly, then you ask yourself a question. And we keep going back and forth until one of us gets the question wrong, doesn't know the answer. And that person gets the prize. I'll go first. Do you know how a rabbit can dig a hole in the ground without getting any dirt on the outside? He digs it from the inside first. And the other man said, well, how does he do that? To which he replied, I don't know, that's your question. We'll just 
just keep it rolling, I suppose. One. Stop. Okay. Season three, episode three, part two. I don't think it'll be, again, a rabbit hole that we can fully get to the bottom of. But there are a couple additional points I wanted to make. Speaking for a moment just on ingesting something and the effect it has on your body. If you're completely lost with where I'm at, I suggest you go back one and listen to season three, episode three. This is the first time that um, I've got a camera in my face, so I see my face looking back at my face. And I don't know if I can continue the shtick like this. What is the shtick? Well, if I called you someday and said, hey, how you doing? It's me. You probably wouldn't know what I was up to unless you'd listen to these first. So I would suggest go back, um, check out season three, episode three in its entirety and where I left it open for interpretation and probably for me to step in it multiple times. But there were a couple things I wanted to circle back to because I had been making some notes. And the first thing is this. And so I take such heartfelt issue with individuals demonstrating this fear. I mean, even in the introduction, you could get this sense of fear and urgency and this is evil and uh, pointing out to all these things when it's um, not the ultimate precept. It's really not, I mean, I get it. There was changing over of tables. There were flipping of, um, there's definitely atrocities in the world that need to be eradicated. Um, and those are clear, but things like this. Ultimately, what they're talking about is idol worship. And having a, let's say, going back to the Noah commandments, a God above the God a God above the God being the creator, the alpha, the omega. So going back to the source of inspiration coming from that. <clears throat> so if you have two substances, let's say a cheeseburger and a psychedelic substance that comes from the earth, On the one hand, you go through the drive through and you get your cheeseburger. And it's a chemical reaction in your brain, releasing dopamine, creating positive feedback loops that create addiction. And yet there are still just some people who go to get their cheeseburger. And there are people who will eat nothing but cheeseburgers. And there's everything in between. And then on the other hand, you have a psychedelic substance. And you ingest that. and you come in contact with otherworldly beings and your ego dissolves, collapses upon itself in recognition that there is more than you and there is more 
than us and it is intelligent and it does know us and it feels as though it loves us as well. And you come out of this experience with that recognition. And I ask, why is one an act of devil worship and the other not? From the opinion of the Fourth Watch, not from the opinion of Left Coast Caveman. Let me, uh, this is Left Coast Caveman, Season 3, Episode 3, Part 2. A buttoning up, if you will, of some of these open-ended um, topics from Season 3, Episode 3. I am at the Hilton, um... In Studio City. I think we all can agree. We demonstrate our object of worship through our actions, words, and all other outward manifestations of the heart via the body. Body as an act of worship. We worship all of these things because of our sensory perception of the world and this dopamine response in our brain and our, this is where it comes from. And I would follow that logic all the way to the body of Christ being represented by its members, professing many of the same positions as Fourth Watch. This body is the outward manifestation, the acting out of the ideal of the object of worship. This is where I give credit to my buddy Marquise Denard. A Denardian poll would reveal. Uh, Mr. Denard is famous for having changed the culture of a major Fortune 100 corporation by asking all salespeople to stand up. And those with their shirt tucked in kept their job and the ones with their shirt untucked went home indefinitely that day at least in our minds we knew that would be the best outcome so a Denardian poll would reveal observations of this body would reveal many of its members worship other false gods this is no this is no different Idol worship is idol worship. Eating for some could be classified as spiritual experience. Fantasy of the mind runs more rampant than fantasy football. All right. Let me see if I can pull this thing together for a final wrap-up of season three, episode three. Would I agree? Yes. That the individuals which they describe, which are the Hollywood elites in this Hollywood scene and maybe some kids that are of the uh, higher echelon are going and doing these DMT excursions and uh, worshiping the god Molech and throwing darts at him or whatever they do um, and do these chants and whip themselves up into a frenzy and these people who um, make it a habitual thing to go on these excursions and the individuals they describe that are um, perhaps overdoing it a bit. But yeah, I would agree that that is an act of idol worship, in a sense, putting, to use the language of this cast, something more, less supreme, on par or better with that which is the most supreme ideal, belief, way of life, 
journey path, the walk, a recognition of our soul's existence in being on this path on this earth. What I think motivates individuals like Fourth Watch more than the actual Christ-like ideal in earth or way of life. For he didn't thrust. Well, I shouldn't say thrust. It was more of a quiet strength. It was more a resting people in their thoughts by unmistakable and profound truth. Not a fear motivated misunderstanding motivated point of view which doesn't lend to understanding anything more lends to pointing something to something that does exist and accentuating the negative aspects particularly to serve your purpose I take such hard, I mean, I'm not going to spend any more time probably doing videos like this, but for some reason it just, um, I take a hard stance against writers within the Christian literature because I think there is a lot of misunderstanding that gets put on pages without the, without really understanding the impact those words can have on somebody and society. Other religious worldviews have the same dilemma, particularly, you know, the big ones of the world, because they have, or even our United States Constitution, let's say, a codification of a belief system, and then there's amendments added to it and oftentimes, um, the ratifying can be not such a good thing because we inject further and further our own interpretations into those. Such as, in a study on the book of Judges, of which I'm part of. There is an identification of idolatry in speaking of the Israelites driving out the Canaanites from the land and says idolatry is making good as a good aspect of creation, marriage, mountains, business, and so on, into the ultimate source of security, identity, and power. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And say that anybody who cherishes those things which he described, nature, marriage, business, doing business properly, um, more than likely does put God at the forefront of their decision making and therefore are, is successful in those areas. I would say people can, those can be um, valid idols and we see the breakdown of that all the time. And misappropriation of your energy and misappropriation of your focus leads to disaster ultimately.
then he goes on to really um, say something that disturbed me significantly. And this is um, Keller. So this is a, a different, I would say, I would classify him along with those individuals from the Fourth Watch in terms of his beliefs, but he's much more academic about his approach. But every once in a while, they'll throw these things in like, if our children are false gods, I'm quoting, when their lives are troubled, we will lose our joy. And even when their lives might become troubled, which is all the time, we will worry and lose our joy. And I think to myself, well, who wouldn't? And so why is this being brought up in a conversation around idolatry, if only to say that everybody has idols? Unless he's saying something else. In this joy, I can't recall I felt this feeling. If so, it is a long lost memory. These are some notes I took. So let me just wrap this thing up here. I can't recall I felt this feeling, this joy. If so, it is a long lost memory, not like the joy that sticks with you, like true love, such as that between a parent and a child. So the only reason I'm saying this is that We're saying joy, or he, Keller's saying joy is this thing that you need, that you want, that you that you desire, that you hold on to, and that uh, losing that joy is, is somehow associated with idol worship. Why else would he bring it up in this conversation? And so he's talking about eradicating sin from a territory, evil from a territory, because you desire such purity and communion with God that you have an inexplicable joy as a sign of it. And a sign that you're not living in accordance be a loss of joy even in the face of your ch your child being uh, it is your spirit the spirit that dwells within us on this path inspiration creation that which allows us to express joy in our children, in the people that we love, through our body, through our sensory organs, expressing this joy, eating a cheeseburger. Gosh, that was the best cheeseburger I ever had on the summer night of 1969 in my cherry red Corvette bleach white leather interior cruising down Newport Beach, California the ionized air hitting my nostrils and the most beautiful woman in the world sitting beside me on church on Sunday. Anyway, like I said, the rabbit hole can't be, um, can't be fully dug up, but I think that we make mistakes by interpreting. And... Ultimately, Supreme Being is in recognition of a continued path of rehabilitation, repentance, if you will, a removal and eradicating of that which does not serve our higher ideal of ourselves. and the highest ideal of ourself. In 
looking at that worldview is um, Christ. Then there's no place for fear, anxiety, and judgment. So, this is the Left Coast Caveman. This is not the Fourth Watch. Left Coast Caveman. It's about supreme being through modern hunting and gathering. We hunt and gather resources for your body, your mind, your spirit. And I know this is starting to sound like an extremely new agey place to be, but as you can see, and if you've been listening closely to everything from the beginning of season three, you will pick up on the in between the lines and the nuances and the braille between the lines of written text. Um, okay. That's a wrap. We'll move on to season four where I have, or season three, episode four, three, four, where I've got some exciting notes that I'm working on right now that will just perfectly dovetail into this conversation. Until next time, Left Coast Caveman, with nothing but love for you. See you next time. Bye. An appendix to Left Coast Caveman Season 3, Episode 3 is about to presume here in Universal City, California. A little place where ideologies end up on the big screen and into your brain. You should look at the town. Left Coast Caveman, Season 3, Episode 3. I didn't feel like it was complete. Something just not fully flushed out. And so we will record a brief dialogue on it. here in Universal, California. Is that the all-seeing eye? Or is it simply a minion? Is it representation? of something greater. I've actually not seen the Minions movies. So somebody would have to comment 
their thoughts on the philosophical underpinnings of giant yellow creatures with one eye. Called minions. As we know, minions has meaning. People of little significance, perhaps? I don't know. But as the sun sets over Hollywood Hills, we will attempt one last stab at this here. Season three, episode three. The topic was inspiration. That was the topic prior to me receiving a video from Fourth Watch. I was traveling down a mental thought of perhaps our ape-like species stumbled upon a patch of psychedelics which may have led to their increased cognitive ability, increased expression of artwork on the cave walls as the fourth watch indicated happened 30 to 40,000 years ago, as evident by the archaeological record. And the fourth watch video went on to describe how anything apart from their particular worldview must be devil worship. Most specifically, the topic of DMT use. And while I would agree that it can be used in devil worship, and that, let's say, if speaking specifically about and from the Judeo-Christian worldview, any act of idolatry would be seen as an unforgivable sin back in the OT and the NT that has been paid for by the person of Christ. Who represents the ultimate ideal and that is the perfect person would lay down his life for the sake of this law and for the sake of these people and for the sake of love and grace and mercy, these things that we lack so much as human beings. Which is why I question, because there can be someone utterly incapable of even perceiving these notions of joy, happiness, selflessness, sacrifice, law, God, can be immediately changed by the use of one time using a psychedelic substance and seeing, experiencing, feeling these things for the first time undergo what's referred to as a spiritual awakening. And while I would agree that the chasing after that, via that, would indeed 
fall under an act of worshiping and divinity being placed on something that is not divine, ultimately divine. But it does give people a peek at it, which is why on the first version of this, we discussed the difference between, or we did not discuss it, but we brought it up and said that there is a difference between contact and communion. That is precisely what was meant by that. And in the Fourth Watch podcast, he does mention that there are things there are facts, let's say, that we may not be fully aware of. To which I replied, yeah, that perhaps in nature exists conduits to make contact with God that are not evil in nature. And it's always important to reference what definition of God you're referring to. And I would say that the closest understanding I've come to that is from the Judeo-Christian account throughout history, which is the Alpha, the Omega, the Creator, the Grand Architect behind it all. an intelligence incomprehensible, although through miraculous storytelling over time and interconnected literature, we've put our thumb on it. And we are the ones who screw it up then after that. By reading what has been written in writing about it and creating dogma about it such as this land is my land this land is your land draw a line in the sand and shoot missiles over that line because you are ordained on a mission to eradicate evil from the world. And I question where that precept has ever been of value to the species. And I would have to assume when such an evil exists that it must be dealt with and it's universally true that um, something reprehensible and evil is occurring And I'm not sure if I clarified anything or muddied the waters. So I should read a little bit from my notes to see if anything uh, more poignant comes to the surface. 